The Dickheads are presented in color. Hello, Dickheads! This pink laser beam of truth is going through the brain hole of John Bruner. So we are basically going to be brunettes for the day. Um, so get ready to put on your mask, uh, don't drink the water, and we're going to talk about The Sheep Look Up, which is not only one of my top ten favorite science fiction novels, it is also my number three horror novel of all time, behind uh, Wet Bones by John Shirley and Swan Song by Robert McCammon. Number three, Ain't Bad. So, uh, joining me from the burning hot lands of Arizona is Dwayne of Oxygen Man Books. Dwayne, is it, it's, I know I just asked you, it's, it's Dwayne uh, Pice or Pet, I'm so terrible with names. It's Pesice. Pesice. Dwayne Pesice of Oxygen Man Books. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Dwayne, tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do, and then we'll introduce Mark. Well, I write things, mostly speculative fiction. A lot of it is explicitly based on Bruner's work. I like to extrapolate that because it was so prophetic. And I'm a musician and a cook and other things, but we're not talking about those today. And you're returning to the Dickheads podcast after having done um, the first episode that I ever recorded of the Hugo series on Stand on Zanzibar before I even decided it was going to be a Hugo series. Yes. So, so welcome back to the Dickheads podcast and also returning to the Dickheads podcast for, I don't know, maybe his eighth or ninth time. At this point, I don't know anymore. Uh, Mark Conlon. Uh, Mark, tell the people who you are and what you do. My name is Mark Gabrish Conlon, a longtime science fiction fan, a former editor publisher of Zenger's News Magazine, which is how I met David when he was getting into some good trouble and I was writing about it. And um, I'm very interested in uh, books like this one that um, uh, have direct uh, connections with... Um, live social and environmental issues, uh, big fan of politics, big fan of music, um, was just listening to some of the Chicago white jazz musicians from the late 20s whom I've referred to as punk jazz because they were kind of doing the same in-your-face thing as punk rockers embracing this, uh, you know, looked down on musical form that was relatively easy to learn and basically, you know, offering themselves as rebels to the status quo. Nice. All right. Uh, and Mark has been with us before for many episodes. He joined us for Stranger in a Strange Land. Uh, he also joined us for Moon is a Heart's Mistress and The Iron Dream, which came out the same year as The Sheep Look Up, but we'll get to that here in a little bit. So uh, let's talk about the writing and publication history of The Sheep Look Up. If you're not familiar with John Bruner, you should really go back and listen to our Stan and Zanzibar episode. He was um, pretty much the British Philip K. Dick in many ways, um, in writing challenging and uh, interesting science fiction, good political science fiction, as well as the pulpy stuff. Uh, Bruner published a lot in the 60s and 70s. So um, there's this trilogy of books that uh, Brunner wrote that are considered his masterpiece. However, a lot of people consider it to be a quartet of his four um, best science fiction books, which are commonly referred to as the Club of Rome Quartet. Um, and uh, those are Stand on Zanzibar from 1968, The Jagged Orbit from 1969, The Sheep Look Up, the one we're talking about today from 1972, and his very prophetic pre-cyberpunk, cyberpunk novel, The Shockwave Rider, which came out in 1975. Um, they all deal with political issues and um, are, are considered to be his uh, kind of gold standard of his career. Um, does anybody know what the uh, Club of Rome Quartet name is referring to, or should I explain that? Please explain uh, it. I remember the Club of Rome quite well. I remember reading 
their first book, The Limits to Growth, when it came out. And they were basically making a lot of the points that Bruner mentions in the book, like, you know, the world was becoming way too polluted to support its number of people. And in particular, it was becoming way too overpopulated. And right. they were going to help publicize the idea that, um, because, you know, if humans did not reduce their population by lowering their number of births, nature would do it for us by ramping up the number of deaths. And obviously in the current pandemic, I have thought quite a lot about that and wondered if this is indeed the beginning of that process, that nature is just going to lose a lot more diseases on us that will uh, call the population and get us back to, you know, a population size that the earth can actually handle. Right. So the Club of Rome was a think tank and they wrote lots of essays and articles and things. And uh, John Bruner was heavily influenced by, by their type of thinking. And, and so these four books in particular, um, although the Jagged Orbit for me, um, I haven't read it yet. It's the one I haven't read of the quartet. So um, I am going to read it eventually, but um, I, until I started doing research for this episode had not like really heard to the, heard of the Jagged Orbit being considered a part of a quartet with these books. I've always heard people refer to uh, Bruner's trilogy. Uh, Dwayne, um, is that how you kind of viewed these books? Yeah, Jagged Orbit is adjacent, but I don't think it's necessarily a part of it. I mean, the books aren't really related except thematically, but the Jagged Orbit is another step away from the themes that the other three books share. Yeah. Bruner has uh, amazing prophetic ability compared to a lot of his other science fiction writers from that era. Um, we talked a lot about that in the Stan Zanzibar episode that he was writing about school shootings and mass shootings as far back as uh, Stan and Zanzibar. And in this book, there's, for example, a very detailed chapter about electric cars that um, is, is like eerily correct. And as we talk about Sheep Look Up a little bit further, you'll see that it's funny because during the George W. Bush years, everyone thought President Pesky in, in, in this book was a dead ringer for G.W. Bush, but everyone who reads it now thinks it's a dead ringer for Trump. <clears throat> and of course, he was writing about Nixon at the time. <laughs> so uh, the cycles of history kind of um, play into uh, what John Brenner was doing. So uh, the title is taken from John Milton's poem, the, uh, like, um, is it Lacedius or like, I'm, again, it's me and my pronunciations, um, from, from uh, 1637. And um, the lines from the poem make up the epilogue, which is the hungry sheep look up and are not fed and swollen with wind and the rank mist they draw, rot inwardly and foul contagion spread. So that poem is where the title comes from. It started as a double day hardcover back in the day um, and later Ballantyne did mass market and up until 1987, Del Rey um, had various ma um, uh, paperback editions of uh, the Sheep Look Up, but it was 1987 when it fell out of print. And it was not back in print until after Bruner died when, and the, this edition, if you're watching on YouTube, that's when this edition came out from Ben Bella Books, and they did a hardcover and paperback. And this version came with an introduction by San Diego's own David Brin, and an afterward by environmentalist James John Bell. And both of them basically talked about how prophetic the book was. All right, so uh, before we start getting into some some really deep details, just basically, Mark, this was your uh, first time reading it, but Dwayne, you read this uh, obviously back in the day. Can you tell us your history with reading it before we talk about Mark's history with it? I bought it when it came out through the Book of the Month Club. Right, and you were already a Bruner fan, correct? Yes, I had found out about Bruner through Dangerous Visions because he had a story in there and I bought a book by everybody that had a story in that volume and Stan on Zanzibar was that book because it was 1969 when 
I went out and bought all of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, joining us now, and I'm going to bring him into the conversation, is New York Times bestselling author, filmmaker, and uh, writer-director, John Skip. Um, and John, are you there? Can I, I am here, but I don't see me. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. I just hit start video. There, there I am. Go. All right. So um, uh, we're just going through our history of when we read it. So it's good timing. Um, Stand on Zanzibar and Dangerous Visions. I, I'm with you all the way, man. <laughs> well, and um, so Dwayne read it in Book Club, um, 1972. Uh, Mark, you just read it for the first time, correct? Uh, yes, and I wanted to start with a quote uh, that's on page 350 of my edition uh, that seems like it could have written, written today. Uh, mm -hmm. writes, there is an ingrained distrust in our society of highly intelligent, highly trained, highly competent persons. One need only look at the last presidential election for proof of that. The public obviously wanted a figurehead who'd look good and make comforting noises. Hmm. I don't know about look good with the new one, but, you know. Um, he's adorable. <laughs> um, well, he obviously thinks he looks good. Right. I mean, I loved it when a friend of mine was watching uh, Trump on TV and he was asked about the accusations that he'd uh, use prostitutes. And he said, do I look like the kind of guy who would need prostitutes? <laughs> yes. 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 That was, I don't think anybody has ever had sex with Donald Trump without expecting some sort of financial remuneration. And that includes all three of his wives. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, my history with The Sheep Look Up is I first read The Sheep Look Up in the mid-90s. Um, mm -hmm. I read a used paperback because I was a huge Brunner fan. Um, I had um, uh, got into him through reading A Crucible of Time, which is a super weird underwater alien novel, and it was just the weirdest fucking thing I had ever read. Mm -hmm. So I uh, kind of in reverse... And then somebody had told me, because they knew I was a radical environmentalist, like, well, if you like John Bruner, you've got to read The Sheep Look Up, which the first time I read it, I was just blown away, and it's immediately what turned me into a fan of John Bruner. And what I realized upon reading it was that it wasn't just a science fiction novel, it was, it was a fucking horror novel, <laughs> and it was scary as hell. And it frightened me beyond belief because one of my biggest fears is that we can't stop the train going out of the station towards environmental destruction. And so for me, The Sheep Look Up just absolutely terrified me when I read it. And then I've read it twice since I read it um, during the George W. Bush years around 2005 was the second time I read it. And then... Um, um, my novel, uh, and I'm sorry to shamelessly plug, but I wrote a novel a couple of years ago called Ring of Fire that was my attempt to do um, something like The Sheep Look Up, um, which was nominated for the Splatterpunk Award for Best Novel the year it came out. And uh, Ring of Fire was my attempt to do that. So in the lead up to it, I reread the sheep look up to kind of get a feel for it and then realized I wasn't doing exactly the same thing, but I was really glad I reread it because um, as an adult, I got levels and things that I hadn't gotten in the last two readings of it. So I think a third reading is where at the time I considered it my number eight horror novel of all time. And after reading it the third time, I bumped it up to number three. Um, John skip. Tell us, what's your history with The Sheep Look Up? Uh, well, again, it was um, um, Harlan Ellison uh, led me to uh, uh, the Dangerous Visions collections and then into the entire uh, body of uh, that new wave science fiction of the era. And um, I don't remember exactly where I found The Sheep Look Up, but it was the amazing cover I believe the original paperback cover with the guy in the gas mask against the like just torched desert uh, landscape. And I was like, oh, this looks fascinating. Uh, uh, turned to the back cover where it was something about 
uh, Austin Train uh, uh, created a movement that he couldn't stop and, uh, and uh, just saw that it was a, a, an eco-side novel. And that was very, very much uh, what I was looking for at that particular time. I read it. It floored me. I promptly got Stand on Zanzibar and Shockwave Rider and uh, inhaled all of them uh, in short order. I really, really loved the kaleidoscopic macro vision of it, uh, the way that he uh, was constantly intercutting between all of these different weaves of the fabric uh, and, and then pulled them all apart. I loved the fact that I didn't know what was going to happen from one moment to the next. There was nothing remotely predictable about its trajectories. Uh, I loved the inexorable feeling of doom that it raised, the occasional moments of hope, and then the way he just brought the hammer down on them. I loved hitting the last page and just, uh, what's that smell? Oh, that's America. The wind's blowing this way. And it's just like, <laughs> oh, shit. Um, and yeah, it, uh, that, that was uh, that was one of the books that marked me hardest in, in my uh in my early 20s, late teens, early 20s, which is when I read it uh, in the, the 70s. Uh, and yeah, I mean, between that and uh, uh, Vonnegut's uh, Breakfast of Champions and some of the other things that he was writing around that time and what Harlan was doing, uh, it's weird that I didn't turn out to be uh, a speculative fiction writer uh, uh, in, in so far as that, that wasn't the genre where I wound up. But sort of like when I tried to... Uh, hook up with the new early new age movement in the uh in the mid 70s uh i was too dark for the new age and uh and uh speculative fiction had kind of uh that kind of speculative fiction was not in vogue and so i wound up uh by default uh a couple years later in the horror field um but I will say in the horror field, because one of the other influences of my novel Ring of Fire was a little book called The Bridge, which yes. was written by uh, you mm -hmm. and Craig Spector, which was mm -hmm. uh, an environmental horror novel um, in, in the 80s and, uh, um, and also you know, played with these themes. So obviously The Sheep Look Up was probably a huge influence on The Bridge. Your novel it was the huge influence on The Bridge. It, it yeah. was absolutely the huge influence. And it was really weird because I uh, wanted to write an environmental horror story, um, um, wrote the first 150 pages of it. It was boring as fuck. And uh, I threw it away. And then um, there was an incident where uh, I was introduced to a guy at a party who uh, had borne witness to illegal uh, uh chemical dumping out in the boondocks where he lived in Pennsylvania in talking with him and going to research what he, uh, what he told us all of a sudden the picture became clear and, um, and the sheep look up was definitely the template. Although it's, it's very different in its handling. Uh, one of the things about Brunner's book is that it, uh, it's so dry and clinical um, um, I'm not saying that it's, uh, that there's not a lot of emotion, but his delivery system is very dry. And, um, uh, whereas, whereas mine is much more overt and, uh, and, you know, uh, nutsoid, but, uh, in, in terms of, of how it affected me, I, I, I wanted to write something even half as good as the sheep look up and, um, and, I think I did it. I, I might have gotten it at least half as good. So, um, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm such a fan. I, uh, I don't know if you guys have been discussing the minutia of plot and character or, or how you've been approaching it, because I just got here. But, uh, yeah, I mean... Just it, getting I, into the story, too. Right on, right on. So, so let's talk about that. Let's go around a little bit. And I, I'm going to read off a list of some of the things that the book addresses, which is um, long range air pollution, pesticides, famine, unrest, state violence, terrorist attacks, biological invasions, water pollution, treatment resistant diseases. Um, and uh, like, uh, pre you know, this is pre apocalyptic fiction, because it's, it's, it's people are trying to live through this and the sheep look up. Um, 
let's go around. The, it, let's go around, starting with Dwayne. Um, what have I missed? Are there things that you think that this this book is addressing that 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 I didn't get? <laughs> that really occurred to you, something that really hits you home when you first read it and, and when you think about it now? Dwayne? Um, the only thing that I can think of is an aside where both Stan and Zanzibar and the Sheep Look Up have that main character who is making it more of a folk horror narrative, like Chad Mulligan on the one hand and Austin Train on the other hand, where they're the public figure like Ralph Nader was at that time, hmm. saying things are unsafe at any speed. They're trying to lead things in that direction. And that seems to have been borne out by later events because there was, weren't really a lot of those type of people at that time. But now there are. Hmm. Mark, uh, you, this is your first time reading it. So um, reading it now, what what did you connect to to this test? I know you read that quote, but... Was it was it President Pexy that was like the the big thing that you connected to on this? Actually, I think the big thing that I connected to was, uh, as I joked to you when I called you a few days ago, uh, I opened the the first page where it says "Signs of the Times," and it's about you know people being ordered to wash their hands and wear masks. And I thought, is this a novel? It's <laughs> this is all happening right now. <laughs> right, right. And, and and it, it amazed me that when this was first, when the pandemic was first happening, I know the first two weeks of coronavirus, I was like up on my soapbox because there were all these articles about what pandemic sci-fi novels should you read? And it boggled my mind that only one of these articles, one which I'm going to reference later, mentioned The Sheep Look Up. Wow. Only one. And I was furious. I was, <laughs> I was on Facebook every day saying... The Sheep Look Up is the book you should be reading and be depressed about right now because so mu- it says so much about today. And it, it's not exactly the same, obviously, as the issues that we have. Climate change is very different, which is one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book that I did was because, you know, as, as great as, as The Sheep Look Up is and, and, and The Bridge was, they're books of their time and they're dealing with issues that were of their time and I wanted to do something that was climate change and was related. That being said, um, the the way Bruner talks about then is so relevant for how he talks about how we think about today. Um, And the best article that I read on this, and I'm going to be quoting from it later, is The Sheep Look Forward, Counterfactual Dystopias and Ecological Science Fiction as Social Science Enterprise by Katie O'Neill, a distinguished professor at Dartmouth. And this came out in 2018, this article. Mm. And uh, so, you know, and she says in this article that the sheep look up predates cli-fi science fiction that deals with the impacts of climate change and human civilization. And it has none of the earnestness of that that characterizes some of that genre. Bruner's work and its anger is representative of other works of that time. In this case, Anger not against humans per se, but the structures they live in, the corporate slash political power that along with individual neglect and corner cutting pushes the planet towards doom. And John, I I know you and I have talked about the anger of the sheep look up before and the the things that, that kind of drive it. And it's so interesting that he, without having a total focus. We have Austin Train in it, who's a garbage man turned revolutionary, but he's not the the through line through the whole book. In fact, his he's in like seven chapters, maybe seven or eight chapters. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's so interesting how he takes that anger and um and moves it through subtly through the anger isn't in the characters telling you I'm angry, I think the anger in the sheep look up is in the reader's reaction to what they're seeing on the page. That's the anger you're feeling. You don't feel the anger so much of the characters as the anger Mm -hmm. in, in the, you know, in the Holy shit, this hasn't totally gone away. (laughs) Um, Um, 
it, it's really interesting because uh, I just reread the book about two and a half years ago, and um, so and and haven't peeked at it since. So um, uh, most of the names are muzzy for me, but there are certain characters whose rage flies so palpably off the uh, the page, particularly um, um, the character. Uh, was she a nurse who survives eating the bad drug uh, in Africa and comes back and she's the one that makes Deb eat it when she's going to uh, do the, the article mm -hmm. report? Her anger, as a drug crazed as it is, uh, is just, it, 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 it hurts. It, it, it is like being in a room uh, uh, with, a, with a, a schizophrenic off their meds. Um, and uh, which is an experience I had recently, but that's another story. Um, <laughs> and uh, it was scary as fuck. Um, but I think the thing that that got me the most, aside from the gestalt of it, the everything of it, was uh, the disappointment in the people who um, who followed the message badly, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the excesses and the, uh, uh, just, you, you know, the, the frivolous dog shit of so many of the trainites, uh, and, and the wrong courses that they went and just ideas like kidnapping the guy, uh, kidnapping the kid was going to be a really good idea, you know, just, uh, uh, and then, you know, just giving him uh, irreversible uh, gonorrhea in the room where he's stuck eating the same shit that they're eating. Um, um, yeah, his incredible disappointment uh, in our ability to, to negotiate this despite our best intentions was one of the things that broke my heart the most. And I got to meet Brunner in, I believe it was 1992 at Dragon Con in Atlanta, the, the same... Uh, the same weekend I got to get stoned with Timothy Leary uh, and, and meet Robert Anton Wilson. Um, and I went over to Brunner and I just told him how much I loved the book and how much it meant to me and uh, how we were doing a musical performance based on uh, uh, the bridge, the book that had inspired it. And I asked him if he um, um, thought that we were any closer to things getting better. And he was so depressed. I, I, I'm sure he was just uh, he, he and Robert Anton Wilson were were two of the saddest drunkest old uh, bastards I ever met who wrote brilliant things that I admired because both of them uh, you know they had made incredible powerful definitive statements decades earlier and the shit was still going on and you know that that's that's really hard it's it's really hard to lay it all down and go look it's right here and then the world just keeps doing its stupid shit so um yeah th I, I think uh that that was the thing that was the thing that marked me the hardest but there are so many scenes the 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 character who i believe was uh was he was he an irish doctor and he winds up as just one of the casualties of the massacre at the compound uh, uh, and it's one of those things where it's, just, it's like a throwaway line. Uh, there were uh, 370 dead bodies uh, at the end of the night. Dr. Uh, Colonel Averson was among them or something like that. And it's like he, he didn't even give you the, uh, uh, the satisfaction of, of seeing the guy have a fight, you know, try to fight and, and die. He just got – he was just another ca casualty. Uh, as they say in another part of the book, uh, fish in a barrel. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and it's interesting, too, that you had this conversation with Brunner in 92, because that's a conversation that we've had a couple times on the podcast with Barry Maltzberg and um, Norman Spinrad, you know, that, that you know, that, you know, about like, uh, I hate to see it all come true, um, yeah. you know, that these things that we tried to warn you about. Um, there, there is no joy, and I told you so in a moment like that. Yeah, exactly. And um, so the one article that, that did um, talk about, um, there is an article from prospect.org 
um, called uh, Coronavirus Premonitions of Disaster. And it was um, an article about science fiction novels that, that handled this. And uh, this article, I do want to quote from it, said, quote, at the beginning, um, this is the beginning of the end in an eerie prefiguring of COVID-19's devastating impact on the U.S. economy. The economic slowdown caused um, uh, by the, uh, I don't know that word actually, <laughs> uh, leads to mass unemployment a collapsed healthcare system, food shortages, and ultimately mass protests. A neo-fascist rump government involves martial law and starts um, interning and then killing the protesters. On the last talk show broadcast before the government shuts down the networks, a U.S. scientist creating models stimulating the Giardia's relentless global spread makes a modest swift proposal um, a modest proposal Swift would have been proud of, and, and this is the quote from The Sheep Look Up, we can just about restore the balance of ecology if we exterminate 200 million of the most extravagant and wasteful of our species. That is the Americans. The sheep have looked up and indeed, and then this, the article goes on to say Wait. that the Americans, the sheep have looked up and, and, and indeed are, n are not fed uh, the self-immolation of the United States proceeds to its apocalyptic end. So one of the things, yeah, and this article, that's, it's relating to the sheep look up, but it's also talking about how there's this part where in the sheep look up, there's a, a person that goes on television that says, we may just have to give up a huge amount of people. And this was the week that we had the governor of Texas saying, um, well, I'm willing to sacrifice for the U.S. economy, uh, you know, and, and I think older people should be ready to sacrifice because we got to keep the economy going. Mm -hmm. And that was straight out of the sheep look up. Mm -hmm. Straight out of the book. Um, the only thing was that the ceiling didn't cave in right after he said it, which would have been awesome. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, um, but, you know, this, of all the things that have happened since the, the beginning of, of the coronavirus that reminded me of the Sheep Look Up, that, that the Texas governor going on TV and saying, saying that was the moment that I was like, holy fuck, I'm living in a John Bruner novel um, right now. And it's not like that's never happened to me before <laughs> as a John Bruner reader. Sure. But uh, it, it was frightening and scary. And I'm wondering... Um, so I do want to talk a little bit about the fact that this was nominated for the Nebula Award and lost um, in 1972 because it lost to Isaac Asimov's The God Themselves, which, hmm. which is not my least favorite Asimov novel. However, like it's one of those things that when we did, when we reviewed all the Hugo winners over the series on the, on the podcast, um, you know, when we talked about um, Clifford Samack's Way Station beating Cat's Cradle um, and uh, or um, Dune having to share the award with Zelazny's This Immortal, which no offense to Zelazny, it's no Dune. Um, and it's really hard to look at as much as I actually like Asimov's The Gods Themselves, and I think it's one of his better books and has some really interesting ideas, holy shit, it didn't, it's not a better science fiction novel than The Sheep Look Up. <laughs> no. and, and, and it's just weird to, to think about that. Now, of course, you can, you can just have just endless discussions of the politics of war. So, I mean, you know. Sure. Yeah. And, then, and that's not to say, you know, it's just... I'm just saying, look, the fact that The Gods Themselves is a fine science fiction novel, but it's not one where I'm talking, where we're going to be doing a podcast about its prophetic nature or, you know, it, it was about aliens sharing technology from another dimension. Okay, that's cool. And there's cool things going on there, but it's, it's just um, when we look at, you know, what we need to be rewarding the science fiction community for doing. Um, these kinds of warning novels to me are the best of what science fiction can offer. And I'd like to hear everyone's thoughts about, you know, entertainment science fiction versus prophetic science fiction, uh, starting with John. Um, well, I, 
I, I just want to say that um, uh, as the judges were uh, were contemplating their choices, probably a lot, uh, quite a quite a a lot fewer of them were shitting their pants while reading Asimov. So right. so part part of it might have just been, oh my God, this book hurt me. You don't always vote for the thing that hurts you. Uh, you you may respect it, but you may be going. Can we just have nice alien contact for a minute? I don't want to think about uh, impl- in, in, impending ecocide. Um, and so that may have been a, a, a factor. You, you know, a, a, again, um, we shoot the messenger. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we don't give, we, we don't throw parties for the messenger. Uh, we shoot them. And um, um, the fact that he was even on the list at all uh, is testimony to the incredible raw power of the book. But uh, if I had been there and been uh, at that convention, my money would not have been on it. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Dwayne, uh, predictive nature versus entertainment. Predictive by far. Yeah. And I'm, I'm looking right now at a Google list of popular 1972 science fiction books. And Mm -hmm. the list I'm looking at, The Gods Themselves, is the least of the books. We're talking about Roadside Picnic, Dying Inside, The Iron Dream, When Harley Was One, The Book of Skulls, and 334 are the first entries. Yep, and they were all nominated along with it. And, and, um, you know, look, we just recorded our episode on The Iron Dream recently, and that's a whole other thing (laughs) with what... Spinrad was doing there, but um, it is interesting to look back on uh, what was popular in 1972 and and see that, and look, and the gods themselves won both the, the Hugo and the Nebula that year, and and honestly, and you know, it's really goofy, but a lot of people were just excited that Asimov included sex in that book, and that was like <laughs> a big deal, because people were like, because um, Asimov made a point of like, because people thought he was afraid to write adult content. And mm-hmm. so with the gods themselves, like he, he uh, which is weird because he was a pervert. We, we now know. Right. Um, and, um, and certainly history does not look kindly on that aspect of Asimov mm-hmm. now for good reason. And so it, it's interesting looking back on that. That's a whole nother subject. Uh, it's the return of the repressed man. You know, uh, he didn't express it in the arts, so he had to express it in his life. Whereas some people express it in the uh, in their art, and then they don't have to do it in their lives. Exactly, uh, Mark. Predictive versus entertainment. I think I know where you come down. <laughs> Someone who recently wrote a journal entry saying that the out of everything I've read in my life, the book that has probably most affected, you know, the way I view the world and politics and people is George Orwell's 1984. So, um, yeah, I'm certainly the kind of reader who would be sympathetic to the sheep look up, even though, you know, (laughs) even though it's so nihilistic, it makes 1984 look like a Hallmark card by comparison. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to throw out something interesting that uh, I thought of about the sheep look up. And that is, it's kind of negative connection to Ayn Rand. Mm. I, I mm. think John Bruner was, among other things, deliberately writing an anti-Atlas Shrugged. Oh, that's a great observation. Wow. Uh, he, you know, both books have this mythical hero who's on the margins of things and is talked about, but we don't actually get to know until the very end. Both books are setting mm-hmm. us up for this mystery character making a big speech about his ideals and the mere expression of them will revolutionize uh, humanity and solve all our problems. Yeah. Mm. You know, Rand's vision of environmentalism was quite the opposite of Bruner's, uh, just as her view of capitalism was, mm-hmm. that, um, you know, in Atlas Shrugged, the secretive genius John Galt has invented a motor that runs on air, which was Rand telling us that the spirit of entrepreneurial capitalism is so powerful it can literally defy the laws of physics. Mm. Um, and John Bruner's 
uh, mystery character is trying to warn us uh, that we can't keep defying the laws of physics, the laws of nature, that if we keep dumping our garbage everywhere, sooner or later it's going to catch up with us and there won't be anything we can do about it. And, you know, in my notes, I described The Sheep Look Up as a nihilistic book because it is basically saying, yeah, there's nothing we can do about it. Sorry. Uh, the social structures, and particularly the, the capitalist elite, are so powerful they will be able to eliminate anybody who tries to offer resistance. So, you know, there's nothing we can do to stop the apocalypse that is just going to come. And, you know, that's it. Sorry, guys. Mm -hmm. Yep. And, and that is certainly something that uh, we had confirmed to us by uh, um, Skip uh, having the chance to meet him at Worldcon in uh, 1992, which I'm super jealous of. And, um, by the way, I had a chance to buy a signed copy of Crucible of Time a couple months ago, and um, I I blinked, and I went back the next day, and it was gone. Um, like, and I had I, it was this close, um, <laughs> and uh, but anyways, I do uh, want to quote from this Katie O'Neill article, the Dartmouth professor article again. Um, and this is, quote, The sheep look up seen from the vantage point of 1972 as a warning to a world starting to spin out of control to protect its environment and its people. Seen from the vantage point of 2018, even though to an extent we have avoided some of the scenarios detailed by Bruner, um, echoes crop up in the news and online. Since I first read the novel, I have free too frequently heard or read things that take me straight back to it. These include botched aid shipments, bee colony collapse, corporate uh, corner cutting, new research on long-term effects of chemicals, ineffective presidents blaming problems on outside agents, drug-resistant forms of old diseases, conditions in failed states in Africa, and so on, even gated communities, the aftermaths of Hurricane Katrina, and in 2017, the cluster of hurricanes, um, Harvey, Irma and Maria whipped through Houston and Florida and devastated Puerto Rico also reflect social and ecological vulnerability of the novel's characters and settings. I think that that is a pretty uh, spot on. I like that she brought up, because when she brings up like the age shipments and the bee colony collapse and, the, the, and, and those things, we're seeing a microcosm of that happening just within the coronavirus response where... Um, you know, Jared Kushner um, uh, gets um, tree, or, uh, tests sent from the United Arab Air Emirates, and because they're going to be going to democratic states, he just uh, lets them expire, and nobody gets use of them. And we find out that, you know, this, that the president's son-in-law is uh, basically sabotaging uh, recovery efforts, efforts and testing efforts in democratic states. That's, that's a prexy thing I could see happening <laughs> big time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, that's just one example. But um, the sheep look up, uh, you know, and for me, one of the, the most powerful scenes is when, um, and, and shout out to uh, Austin Train being from San Diego, uh, represent, uh, that he was a garbage man here. And one of my favorite scenes is the scene where he's talking about the smell of the garbage and how hot it is, and basically he has this whole conversation with a neighbor who's just like, yeah, we're well, just going to have to deal with, with the smell of it. And it was funny because we had a situation um, here in San Diego just yesterday, it's kind of ironic and funny, where we had neighbors who have trash cans that are in our alley that are right underneath their window, Hmm. And they had they moved the trash cans out from underneath their window, and we assumed because they smelled so bad, um, and they put them right in front of our gate. So when we came out, we couldn't get out of our gate. And it was funny because I had just read this chapter, reread this chapter with Austin Train, and I thought to myself, "Oh my God, this is so weird! It is so weird that you know this book. It just it happens all the time." <laughs> it's the gift that keeps on giving this book. It, it certainly is. Um, and so now I want to go around with everybody and, and get um, uh, some, some ideas about, because I personally believe this is a science fiction novel that should be taught. It, um, hmm. 
it, that, and look, I do, a, I do a Philip K. Dick podcast, right? And I want everyone to be revisiting Philip K. Dick and, and going through all of his things. But, you know, recently somebody was talking to me about it and I said, well, honestly, um, if a John Bruner podcast was more marketable, it would have been my first go-to. Mm. <laughs> Um, and honestly, I knew more people were interested in listening to, to PKD, but it's exciting for me to be able to extend to other writers. Not yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that you had Spin Rat on. I think that's awesome. I like it, it a lot. Oh, and we've done Maltz Burgers and we've done like the whole thing. But um, because we, you know, the Dick adjacent work is, is an important part of what we do here because uh, well, PKD has the benefit of a total recall of a Blade Runner of, of Minority Report to get mm-hmm. his books out to people. John Bruner doesn't, and Norman Spinrad doesn't. Although he did write one of my favorite episodes, Star Trek, that Norman Spinrad. Um, but I will say, <laughs> um, this mission of getting the work of John Bruner out there, I think, is something that um, is a cause that I really you know, want to push forward. How do you think, um, how, and, you know, how do we, how should we approach promoting the sheep lookup? Uh, starting with John, Mark, and then Dwayne. Well, I mean, I think somebody needs to make a movie of the shockwave writer. Yes. Because um, it's such an astonishing book and it is also a very optimistic book, uh, which the sheep lookup is not. Uh, and I think that if that were to happen and be pulled off properly, uh, it would make people go, what else did he do? And then you could like uh, show them the sheep look up, uh, which would be, you know, just, uh, it, it would be a slaughtering miniseries on the level of threads, you know, in, in terms of, of how uh, people would respond to it. And I, I bring these things up just because we are such a uh, cinematically uh, driven species at this particular point in our evolution. In terms of getting people to read it, um, aside from telling everybody I know uh, you should really read this book, which I do with alarming frequency, um, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm open to all ideas. And, and I mean, stand on Zanzibar, I mean, Jesus. You know, the, the guy was just so brilliant. And, and again, uh, so, so on it, so completely on it. Um, um, his, his concern, talk about a guy who actually was ahead of his time um, uh, in, in ways that, you know, that, that it, it's such a cliche, but sometimes you, you look at a guy and you go, oh man. But the fact of the matter is he was very much of his time and had he not done that stuff, we wouldn't be equipped to talk about it the way we are in this, the time that we're in. Right. And, and I don't know if it means, like, adapting, what like, A Maze of Stars or one of his more space opera things to get people's attention. That may be a, a path, too. But I agree with you that doing something on film, it, it, it unfortunately, might be the, the, the thing that gets the most eyeballs towards what he's doing. I do think you, you could adapt The Sheep Look Up, but, boy, as a first thing out, it would be it would be very hard to do. Um, Mark, what are your thoughts on, on this, on spreading the word on Sheep Look Up? It's a book that I actually have a hard time recommending to anybody because it is so damn depressing, especially now when it all seems to be happening. It's, you know, you know the basic message of the Sheep Look Up is hopelessness, that, you know, we have already gone way too far in terms of polluting our environment, dumping our trash, uh, reproducing ourselves uh, to way larger a population that we can support ecologically. And um, we've also created this incredibly powerful ruling class, probably more powerful than any ruling class that has existed in human history till now, that can literally shape our thoughts, um, constrain how we view the world, and you know, as happens in the book, simply, you know, and, you know, quietly and methodically eliminate anybody who poses a threat. So it's basically, you know, it's basically such a downer. I can't imagine, uh, you know, any producer or any studio greenlighting it for a movie, you know, 
and Skip's probably right that uh, if we want, you know, <laughs> the Bruner message out there is going to have to be through a movie of one of his uh, more optimistic or at least less depressing tales. And, um, you know, it's nice to know that there are a few more optimistic and less depressing tales in his oeuvre. But, uh, you, know, it, you know, you know, I have a hard time recommending recommending this because, you know, I say, okay, read this book. You're going to get as depressed by the future as I am. You're going to, <laughs> you know, among other things that Bruner uh, has convinced me that, you know, we're not going to have the life we had before SARS-CoV-2 uh, ever again. But, you know, this pandemic will pass eventually, but there'll be another one and another one and another one and another one, which is what happens in Bruner's books. And, you know, everybody is always sick from something. Right. And, uh, you know, it's hard to believe that, uh, you know, it's an important book and I think everybody should read it, but I have a hard time, you know. Uh, then you're going to have a great experience with it. <laughs> yeah. It's not something you're going to enjoy. Uh, it's something that will, you know, get you as depressed about the future as it got me. Well, but I think also that you need to look at it as a, as a, as a call to action of, of like, you know, this is uh, something that we can avoid if we all work together and we, like, try to make a better future. Um, well, maybe, maybe in 1972 you could have read it as a call to action and a future you could avoid. In 2020, it's really hard to read it that way, which is probably, you know, why Skip had the experience with Mr. Bruner that he had 20 years after he wrote The Sheep Look Up, three years before he died, uh, mm -hmm. you know, of you know him saying no you know you know what you know whatever uh, I hoped for my warning it didn't happen people are still doing this shit and they're going to keep doing it and then they're going to keep doing it and they're going to keep doing it and the people who really hold power in the world uh, have the power to make sure that they keep doing it and you hey, know nothing is going to happen nothing is going to change far be it for me to be hopeful uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> when we cycle back around, I do have a couple more things to say, but I know we... Okay. Uh, we got one more yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't see why it would, wouldn't be a tough sell to the Stranger Things, Black Mirror type people anyway. I could see it being done as a TV series. Well, and I think you'd have to update it a bit to deal, deal with climate change. For Absolutely, sure. but all you have to do is get access to that world. Yeah, well, and I yeah, think you easily could do, do that. Uh, the episodic nature of the book would lend itself to that. Yeah, and you yeah. could do the same structure with just kind of doing a little less of the pollution thing and a little bit more of the of the of the heat, right? Like the, the raising temperature and the and, and, the, the, and the, the heat would cause the same things. Like the purple worms is what's always struck me, and the yeah. garden. The mm -hmm. heat causes that same kind of thing. I live in southern fucking Arizona. Yeah, yeah, I know <laughs> you know about shit. <laughs> Shit mutates fast. Wow. Well, and, and, and I do think, um, and what I was trying to do with Ring of Fire was to, um, uh, to bring in the whole uh, wildfire climate change thing. And, 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 um, but there's also um, the idea of the melting ice caps and the diseases that are unleashed uh, because of that is a huge part of, of, of what I was trying to do. But I do think that that is something that could also be a part of a Sheep Look Up series because I think you could follow the same. Look, I believe it could be done. But I think with what, what, what Skip's saying is that maybe you start with Shockwave Rider. The only problem with Shockwave Rider, if you Shockwave Rider, all these people are going to be like, oh, this is just like the Matrix and just like all this. And you, you have to be able to say no. But that's what kills me. Like the people that are like, oh, idiocracy is so original. I'm like, no, go back and read your corn booth and there you, you'll find right. out. Right. Absolutely, yeah. but uh, as Dave was saying, uh, every uh, every one of these themes need to, to be restated for its time. Yes, every so often, and it's really important. And it's a valuable service that needs to be done. Um, I was just going to say, um, Tom Sabini, who was also at that same event where I met uh, 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 Leary and and Brunner and Anton Wilson, and, et, et cetera, uh, just said something the other day. Uh, he basically just said, uh, just remember that after the Black Plague came the Renaissance. And, um, and I was just sort of like, it was thrown back to when 
I met a lot of interesting people. Uh, when I met Buckminster Fuller, it was 1977 mm -hmm. at the World Symposium on Humanity in, uh, in Toronto. And uh, this was an event that was gathered together uh, ostensibly to save the world. I did not realize that it was the first new age convention. So it was essentially it was a dog and pony show where everybody was there to sell their books. Um, and I, I came out crushingly disappointed because uh, I was hoping we were all going to actually get together. Yeah. Uh, me and Bucky Fuller and Ralph Nader and uh, uh, Joseph Campbell and all these other cats, we were all going to get together and change the world, even though I was 21 years old and nobody knew who the fuck I was. Um, um, but when I met uh, Bucky, he was in the, the parking lot coming into the university and he was surrounded by all these reporters. And I'm here with like hair down to here and I just kind of wandered into the circle of what was happening. But he kept looking at me because he knew I was probably the only person in, uh, in the ring that would understand it because everybody else was uh, straights with, with microphones pointing in his face and asking him stuff. At that point, he had been conducting the world game for, uh, for, for quite a few years. And that was uh, getting a bunch of scientists together to talk about uh, the feasibilities of world resources and how long we had to go. And uh, according to the world game, uh, we should have been dead 30, 40 years ago, uh, according to his estimates from where we were there. But he said, you just have to remember that the humans are extremely resilient species. When, uh, when uh, towards the end of, the, uh, of World War II, uh, the Nazis ran into uh, a situation where they were out of rubber for tires for their trucks. And uh, uh, they were just about to confront uh, massive uh, swarms of Russians, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they were desperate, like, what are we going to do? We don't have rubber for our trucks. So what did the Nazi scientists do? They came up with fake rubber. Um, you know, it, 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 when pushed to a corner, we tend to come up with things. And what, what, what's the uh, Winston Churchill uh, quote? Uh, America can be counted on to do the right thing after having tried everything else first. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I don't think we're done yet. Uh, uh, or, you know, to quote another guy, Frank Zappa, uh, uh, jazz isn't dead, it just smells funny. And that's kind of how I feel about the world right now. Um, you know, it's like, it looks bad, but we're not done. No, and and look, it's, it's speaking as somebody who was hardcore with the environmental issues, especially in the late '90s when I first read the Sheep Look Up. Um, uh, I was convinced we wouldn't be here as long as as we are today, um, and I think, in some regards, um, that doesn't mean that the issues aren't terrible and that that they aren't bad for other people some of it is our privilege in our particular locations and how we interface with the environment um some are luckier than others and uh and and certainly we have halted some things and we have slowed some things down um the trump years have been terrible for the environment because of his basically turning the EPA into it just basically doesn't exist anymore. And we know we fired the pandemic team and then we ended up having a pandemic. And so it, yes, it can be depressing to look at the sheep look up and say, here we are again. Um, but um, one hopeful way I would like to look at it in relation to what our mission is here, which is to study science fiction is, is that, there's a whole new generation of science fiction writers that are looking for information and content, and they're coming to these podcasts to learn about the people that were before them. Not everyone in the sci-fi genre, the younger people, want to learn about the history of the genre, and that's okay. There doesn't need to be a canon. But if there is a canon, if there are people who are interested in the canon and they want to learn how to do these things, I personally am a believer in the canon. I want people to look back and see... What came before them? Sure. I don't believe it should be mandatory. No. You can build your whole new path as a, as a new generation. That's fine. But if you're coming to us and you're looking for information about who did it and who did it really well in the past, it's important to look at John Bruner. It's important to look at what he did. That being said, um, 
for John Bruner's message to move forward within the genre, we need writers to, to look at these gold standards and say, I want to do that. Right. And look, I'm saying this kind of self-serving because that's what I did. That's what you did, John, when you wanted to write the bridge and, Mm -hmm. you know, 20 years later, I stood with you at a hotel in Portland and said, the same thing that you did to Brunner. I want to do what you're doing. <laughs> I want to do the next generation. And it was very important for me that Ring of Fire be in the line of, of succession of books with The Sheep Look Up and The Bridge. And I'm hoping that we will continue to have, the cli fi will continue to become a thing because we need to confront it. There was not um, a subgenre of pollution sci-fi or population sci-fi, or um, what was it? The Quartet of Rome um, was the thinking group. The the the, the, the Club of Rome. Club of Rome, right? Bruner was inspired by the Club of Rome, and there was not a subgenre of people doing it. Now we do know that there was here and there environmental science fiction. Even you know, um, Dick was it's a, people. Yeah, um, exactly. And um, Dick was addressing it, and, you know, there was cli-fi issues, and even in um, Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldridge. So it was there. We were doing it. But we need to move forward, and we need the genre to be addressing these issues, partially because um, we just need voices out there on these issues. So that's a lot of words for me to just basically say that I, that I wanted to cover the Sheep Look Up because I want people to be talking about this book forever. And I want more people to be reading this book. And I want, um, fuck, I want this thing to be taught. Like if there's, um, stayed on Zanzibar might, in my opinion, might be a slightly better science fiction novel, but this is the better warning Mm. right here. And I, I want it being taught. So, okay. Final thoughts, everybody, on on the sheep look up. Like, let's bring it home, starting with Dwayne, um, and then we'll get around to Skip. I've already talked enough. <laughs> well, before the broadcast here, I was looking up some related music. Just type the sheep look up into YouTube and Ooh. found six or seven different tunes, um, one of which is actually a halfway decent rap tune, and I hate rap, so... <laughs> strange to say but it updates it fairly well and it has the feel of the sheep look up world to it all of them do and i shared them on my facebook page so people can read them and i think i've become inspired to do a sheep look up tune myself oh excellent well that's cool um well i i, I know that there i think that that afro futurist band uh hip-hop band clipping had a line about uh, about the sheep look up in one of their songs too, um, but I could be wrong about that. But either way, clipping's awesome, and everyone should listen to that. Um, and uh, so, Mark, final thoughts uh, wrapping up your sheep look up commentary. Well, thank you, David, for uh, having me read it. Uh, as I said, it's a you know it's a fascinating book. Uh, it took me a little while to get into the multiple plot lines and the rapid cutting back and forth between sets of characters, but, uh, you know, once I got a pretty good feel for who everybody was and how they related to each other and, you know, what Bruner was trying to do structurally, uh, it got a lot more interesting. Although, as I said, my main <laughs> reaction to this book is just total despair that uh, you know, these these prophecies are happening and we had, uh, you know, 48 years to deal with this issue since, you know, the time he wrote them. And... You know, one thing I've mentioned to a number of people is that, you know, John Bruner might have intended the Prexy character as a caricature of Richard Nixon, but it was Richard Nixon who signed into law the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act and the law creating the Environmental Protection Agency. All of these uh, legal structures that Donald Trump is doing his best to get rid of. And so, you know, if anything, it has even got worse that, you know, Bruner kind of tosses off a mention of those laws and says, you know, well, of course, the corporations are just going to ignore them and circumvent them. But, you know, even even granted that they did, uh, those laws still did some good. 
and the people Nixon appointed to run the EPA were people who, you know, may have been conservative in other respects, but were serious about environmental protection. And, mm -hmm. you know, you know, the, the whole thing, it's just been kind of a, you know, a steady downward trend in our leadership, even within the limits of capitalist democracy from, you know, from Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford to Ronald Reagan to the Bushes to Trump uh, with, you know, an, you know, an occasional intermission of a halfway decent Democrat in the middle of all that. But it's just been, you know, kind of this downward spiral. And, you know, Bruner just sort of reinforced every, you know, negative view I have of histories of humanity's likely history to the point where, uh, you know, my husband Charles just got so tired of hearing me talk about this that he joked, ah, oh, Mark Codman, end times prophet. <laughs> uh, well, you know, um, Bruder definitely uh, can bring that out in you. And, and, but I just, it's all about how fucking brilliant he was, I think. But um, John Skip. I think that um, I think that he smelled Reagan coming. Reagan was an up and coming uh, 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 California politician at that point, so he may have been uh, referencing uh, b because yeah, Prexy has the kind of uh, uh, homey touch uh, it, to his his deranged bluster that was not a a Nixonian characteristic, uh, you know one of the least warm guys we've ever had in the presidency. But uh, yeah, I, I think he smelled Reagan coming uh, amongst his many other uh, terrifying predictions come true. Um, I would say um, any conversation on Cli-Fi needs to go, okay, but Sheep Look Up is the OG, right? Right. Um, and uh, you, let him photobomb every conversation about this until people catch on. Uh, if, if you if, if you want to spearhead the possible uh, miniseries or whatever uh, the fuck might happen, uh, just yeah, having him photobomb every time anybody tries to talk about the environment uh, like it hasn't been done before, just toss him in the mix uh, uh, because because he really is he really is the OG. And you know how how you how you sell a TV series that the sheep look up actually um, skip and I say this to you because I'd like you to do it um, is you you sell it on Chernobyl the success of HBO right. Chernobyl yeah because um, what, what you know it sh th there's nothing more depressing than that show um, was and it was horrifying to watch and 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 I think the way you always have to look in Hollywood. You always have to look for, it's like this and it can yeah. be like this success. And I think the way you sell a sheep look up series is you say it's Chernobyl for climate change and. Right. But uh, it's American. So it's more like gummo. <laughs> well, wow. you can say you know, Chernobyl meets gummo is a really weird Hollywood cross. <laughs> <laughs> Although I love it. <laughs> but I do think that that's how you, that's how you sell this, and 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 you know, fuck, I'd be first in line to be on that writing staff. But, um, but I, I, I tell you, um, I, I like what you're saying about photobombing all the cli-fi talk. Um, I don't think I was as as hard on that as I have been. I also think the any discussions of post-apocalyptic fiction, um, any discussions of end of the world stuff, um, you can slip it in there. Um, and uh, anytime that people are talking about predictive science fiction, you have to mention Stand on Zanzibar and The Sheep Look Up. Um, it is your duty. And, and Shockwave of, Rider, which predicted the fucking internet. Exactly. And um, Stand on Zanzibar, which predicted school shootings and mass shootings. And, yes. yes. And, and, Mucking. Yes. Mucking. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, um, it, is, it is our duty as brunettes um to uh <laughs> to to uh slip it in there where, wherever you can um i believe that and 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 photo bombing that is is very important so i'm gonna wrap this up um i don't know if, i don't know if a rating system because we usually yeah. do ratings on the podcast but i uh, do one more thing yes uh, yeah when you're talking about oh how would we sell the sheep look up at a mini as a mini series uh, it occurs to me that you know, just about anybody in Hollywood would uh, look at us and say, well, yeah, 
but you got to give it a happy ending. Mm. And uh, there's a great story when Lewis Milestone in 1930 directed the film All Quiet on the Western Front. He was continually badgered by the suits at Universal to give it a happy ending. <laughs> and finally, he called them up and said, I've got your happy ending. We have the Germans win the war. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Oh, yeah. Well, Remember what you wish for, man. I just recently heard, I was listening to an Enemy Mind podcast, and the, the guy who first directed the movie and got fired after two weeks, which, by the way, you should listen to that because he lets it fly. He refers to Robert De Niro as a three-foot-tall, backstabbing motherfucker in the interview. Wow. Like, does not, like hold it back, but it was funny. He was talking about how he was developing a movie about a guy with cancer for Tom Cruise. And then the guy from the studio said, does he have to be sick through the whole movie? <laughs> and it's like, yes, yes, he does. Yes, he does. <laughs> all right. So guys, um, I don't think we need to fully rate it. I think we're all, I don't know. I think five stars all the way around, but Mark, are, are, are you the holdout? Because you, you, you hated the experience of, of oh, the Oh, I think it's a great book. It was just, you know, it was just such an incredible downer, especially reading it now, especially reading it during uh, SARS-CoV-2, especially reading it during a time when the United States seems to have lost the ability to make anything work. That, you know, we keep running into these stories, you know, wildfires, shortages, um... You know, this, that, and the other thing, you know, this country just doesn't work anymore. And that was one of the big things I got from Bruner's book, that, uh, you know, it is a country that has pushed itself so far to the limits of what it can do that it, you know, literally nothing works. You have to wonder where you can drink the water, where you can wash your clothes, where you can do this, where you can do that, where you can dump your garbage, where you can, you know, do all the things that we totally take for granted, including turning the lights on, let alone... Uh, using the technology that we're doing to uh, create this podcast. And, you know, that was one of the big points of this book is that nothing works anymore. We can no longer count on anything to work. We're not sure whether the light will turn on when we have the switch. Not with all the stories about rolling blackouts in California. And some people, notably an article in the San Jose Mercury News, saying, well, it's all the fault of the environmentalists. We're building all these damn solar panels. Solar power plants that don't work at night. Oh, God. Oh, geez. All right. Yeah, that's right. Well, so, uh, um, it, we're rating on a five-star system? Five-star system. I give it 12. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll give it uh, six, um, six gas masks out of five um, <laughs> on my scale. Um, <laughs> uh, definitely... Um, yeah, I, you can't fuck with this book, man. It, you you just can't. It's uh and um uh, and it's it's a must read for horror readers. It's a must read for science fiction readers. It's a must read for environmentalists. It's a must read for people concerned about the future. So uh, all around, and for people who just like incredibly well written literature, Bruner was a fucking hell of a writer. Yes, like, he is. Just just as just as a writer, I mean. Yes, he wrote a, a bunch of pulpy, like, slaver books for Ace Doubles as well, but he was doing that for the money. And th when, when, when Bruner wanted to write something with class, he could do it. And, um, and on top of it, just, just to take away from all of his political stuff, if you th look at Crucible of Time as one of the all-time weirdest alien novels ever written and I had a really funny conversation with Jeremy Robert Johnson once where I tried to explain the crucible of time to him and how great it was and how weird it was at Bizarro Con one year and he just looked at me and he was like that's awesome but I don't ever want to read it <laughs> he's like that sounds incredible but I don't ever want to read it and I was like that's okay it's not for everybody um, but that, that being said dickheads um, uh, as always, dickheads, keep it paranoid, stay paranoid, and uh, uh, thanks for joining us today. <laughs>